Good morning. I'm going to be reading Colossians 3, verses 14 through 25. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Thanks for listening. Good morning, church. Great to be here with you again. It's an honor and a privilege every time. When the power went out this morning, I was thinking, oh no, we're going to have to cancel church possibly, but thankfully it went back on in plenty of time. So thank you, Willie, for reading for us. I know it's always nervous coming up here for the first time, but you did great. This morning we'll be continuing on in the book of Colossians. We're in chapter 3, and as we heard through the scripture, we're starting at verse 14 today. My objective with this morning's message is firstly to look at the resurrection of Christ. Secondly, I hope to present the directives or the instructions in our passage in light of this new covenant resurrection life that we are living in. And thirdly, I hope to encourage us to again fix our eyes on Jesus in whom we find the answers to all of life's big questions. Before we get into it though, we'll bow for a word of prayer. Loving Father, we are so grateful that you have sustained us again through another week. You've given us everything we needed, physically, spiritually. We're so grateful, Lord, that you not only reside over us, you dwell in us, Lord, and you have given us your spirit who leads us in truth and wisdom, comforts us when we're in sorrow, heals our pain. We want to again look to you this morning to find sustenance, as we heard, to find nourishment for our souls, and we thank you and advance for all that you will do through the word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So I've entitled this message, Resurrection Life, and before we get into the verses, I'd like to take some time, as I mentioned, to look at the resurrection side or aspect of the gospel. The gospel is, in a sense, like a coin. I have in my hands here a Canadian silver dollar, and it's got a stamp on both sides. It's got Two fellows in a canoe on the front, 1977, and then on the back we've got Queen Elizabeth II. The gospel is very much like a coin in the sense that it needs both sides to be stamped, to be valid. Stamped on one side of this gospel coin, we have God's mercy. There's an emblem of the cross. On the other side, representing God's grace, we have an emblem of an empty tomb. Without both sides completed, this gospel coin would neither be valid nor legal tender, and it would be of no value uh, to us. If Christ had not been crucified, not taken our sin upon himself, not been made sin for us, we would yet carry the penalty of our sin fully. There could be no mercy. If Christ had died on the cross but then remained in the grave, sin and death would not have been defeated, and we would be left unredeemed, without hope, and there could be no grace toward us. During Jesus' earthly ministry and even beyond, into the New Testament church era, there was a sect known as the sect of the Sadducees. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And that was very sad, you see. 
I can never resist those. They rejected the message of grace and salvation through the resurrection of Christ. And even today, this heresy is alive and well. You don't have to look too far to find religions, traditional Jewish groups, even so-called Christian groups that deny the resurrection of Christ. But even amongst resurrection believers in mainstream Christianity, the second side of the, of the gospel or the empty tomb, the resurrection is the side of the gospel that is often neglected or at least less emphasized and less celebrated. Many believers, when you ask them to describe the gospel to, to you, they'll talk about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins uh, as payment, and they'll talk about the mercy of God towards them in not punishing us for our sins. However, there's so much more to the gospel that uh, talks about the resurrection, that talks about the work that Christ did for us and the work that he's doing to us. And uh, this second most glorious side of the gospel, it all hinges upon Christ's resurrection the empty tomb. We may have often heard that mercy is defined as not getting that which we deserve, whereas grace is often defined as getting that which we don't deserve. And I'd like to illustrate the difference between these two concepts, mercy and grace, with this scenario. You're driving down the road, you're five minutes late for work, and you hate being late, if you're anything like me, So you decide to up your speed to 120 kilometers an hour, and it's an 80 kilometer an hour zone. You don't get very far. You see those dreaded red and blue lights in your rear view mirror. Come to a stop, you roll down your window as the offers approaches, and you're obviously fearing the worst. Uh, In Ontario, according to a friend of mine who's an OPP officer, or was, anything in excess of 40 kilometers an hour over the speed limit carries a stunt driving charge young drivers, listen up, a stunt driving charge of $2,000. That's the minimum. If they don't like you very much, they can up that to $10,000. So the officer approaches your window, he shows you the ticket, and sure enough, he's given you the stunt driving charge, $2,000. You reach out to grab the ticket, but before you can take it, he tears it up. I figure if the Sunday school teachers can use props, then we should be allowed to as well, right? Officer says, you know, you really deserve this ticket, but I'm retiring today and I'm in a really good mood, so I'm not gonna give it to you. That was an act of mercy, not giving you what you deserved. You thank him profusely and you start to roll up your window, and just before you've rolled it up, he says, hold on a second. I've got a little gift for you. It's a $200 gift card to the keg. Now this one's not $200, it's $50, which covers about half a meal, but he gives you a $200 gift card to the keg, says, take your wife out for a nice dinner on me. That was an act of grace. He gave you something that you didn't deserve. Now, this is obviously never going to happen. Let's not get our hopes up, right? So, uh, so that, that difference between grace and mercy made it clear to me when I heard this illustration and hope it helped you as well. Forgiveness is an act of mercy from God toward us that was facilitated or procured by Jesus, rising again from the dead. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, I'd like to read out of 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll read the verses 17 through to 22. This illustrates for us very well the importance of both the cross and the empty tomb. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 to 22. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The resurrection proved Christ to be God in the flesh. It proved his sinlessness, his power over sin and death, and it showed him to be the spotless Lamb of God who had come to take away the sins of the world. And in Christ, those of us who have believed on him have conquered sin and death, and we've risen with him to new life. 
received the gift of resurrection life, eternal life, without beginning, without end. And I've mentioned this before, that this eternal life is only possible in Christ because Christ is eternal. And this gift is free to all who believe on Jesus, as Scripture has said. It is absolutely the greatest news in the world. This resurrection life comes with so many benefits, and I've discussed them at length in previous sermons. We've received a new identity. I'm huge on identity, as you've probably learned by now. The, the soft heart, the, the heart of flesh that he's given us, the spirit that comes to dwell within us, uniting with our spirit. We were made the righteousness of God, Romans tells us, sanctified, justified, and conformed to the image of Christ. We were given his indwelling spirit, his divine nature, and his attributes. In fact, the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. His desires have become our desires. We share his love for righteousness. We share in his hatred for sin. His love was shed abroad in our hearts, enabling us to truly love others. And in Christ, we were given every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We, in fact, received the inheritance of Christ. Everything that belongs to Jesus, now imagine this, everything that belongs to Jesus now belongs to us. We are, in fact, co-heirs, it says, with Jesus. And this inheritance, it tells us in Peter, that can never perish, it can never spoil or fade. It is kept or reserved in heaven for us by God. We were made brand new. Born of the Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And this union with Christ is so precious to me. It's become my life source for fighting temptation, for encouragement through the week, knowing that I am a member of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. We are bonded to him by a covenant. And this covenant, interestingly, was not between God and me. And this is an interesting concept, and I'm going to go into it a little bit, but if you want to study it out for yourself, you'll find it in Genesis 15. But this, co this covenant originated with Abraham. It was a covenant that God made between God and God. And I know that might sound confusing, but if you read up on it in Hebrews, it tells us a little bit more about this. In six, Hebrews 6, uh, verses 13 to 20, he tells us that when God made a covenant with Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swear by himself. When we make an oath, we typically swear on, some will swear on the Bible, some swear to God, but we have to swear by someone greater, but there is no one greater than God, so God swore by himself, and he ratified this covenant. It was a covenant between God and God. In fact, if we read the, the history account of Abraham uh, in this uh, scene, God actually puts him into a sleep, or he fell into a deep sleep, while God showed him the details of this covenant. And the new covenant of grace is essentially a fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham, 430 years before the Mosaic law ever came into place. It's an everlasting covenant between God, who cannot lie, Hebrew says, and God, who cannot lie. And it's not like the old covenant that was between God and man. Uh, we know the covenant that God made between Israel and himself. Israel was the other end of that covenant, and they failed repeatedly. They could not keep his commands. They could not please him. But this covenant is immutable in the sense that it cannot be broken. It cannot be changed because God ratified it. He implemented it. He fashioned it all by himself. And we come into the good of this covenant by grace through faith. We receive it as beneficiaries. Hebrews 8 verse 6 tells us, But now has he, speaking of Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry. And a ministry is the same idea as a covenant. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Uh, Hebrews is one of my favorite books because it goes into such great detail about how the new covenant is better than the old. How is the new covenant better? The promises were made by God to be received as a gift. And a gift is, by definition, something you can't pay for. As soon as you were to pay for a gift, it no, it no longer is a gift. You've earned it. And Romans 11, verse 29, gives us the nature of this gift. It says, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. 
They cannot be revoked. God says he will not go back on his promise to us. The Old Covenant was mediated by a high priest. We know the history of that. It had to be a Levite man who would make animal sacrifices on behalf of all the people once a year. So for once, one sacrifice, all the sins of the people were covered for a year. They could feel better about their sins. In the New Covenant, Jesus is our permanent high priest who has once for all sacrificed himself and now serves as our permanent mediator between us and God. In the Old Covenant, there was disparity, there was enmity, there was, um, there was no peace between man and God. But in the New Covenant, Jesus Christ became our peace in that he made peace with God on our behalf. He settled the conflict once for all through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he provided the means for full forgiveness, limitless grace, and permanent peace with God. It is by far a better covenant that not only offers us forgiveness, as I mentioned, but full removal of our sin and an abundant life in Christ that is where the, where the rules have all been kept for us. An agreement that Jesus made with God and we cannot break this new covenant. That's exciting to me to know that I cannot fail in this covenant. I am simply a recipient or a beneficiary of it. With the new covenant, Jesus brought about true liberty, true freedom to serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The letter refers to the Mosaic law here. Romans 7 verse 6 describes this. It says, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, speaking of the flesh, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter or of the law. Why do we as ministers of the gospel make this our focus? Why is this our, our thrust in every message, the gospel of grace? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 tells us, Paul writes, speaking of God, he says, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament or the New Covenant, not of the letter, which is referring to the Old Covenant, the law, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Another translation says that God has qualified us to be ministers of the New Covenant. So I feel that as a, as a, a speaker of the Word, a minister of the Word, we are to focus on the New Covenant of grace. The Old Covenant had a purpose. It served its time to bring Israel specifically under condemnation to bring death to them, to show them that they had not met the requirements of God. But the new covenant is, as I mentioned, ratified and implemented by God himself. We have to know that when we preach law, when we preach out of the old covenant, we are essentially preaching death. That's what Paul told us in this verse in 2 Corinthians. But when we preach Christ and him crucified and him risen again, we preach life to people, resurrection life. Resurrection life is the spirit dwelling in us. Jesus Christ is that spirit. When we, when we hear of the spirit in the Bible, it is also known as the spirit of Christ. And so Jesus Christ is that spirit that dwells in us. And it says in scripture that where the Lord is, or where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation unto them that believe, to the Jew first and to the Greek also. And everything that we do as believers in our everyday life must come from this perspective of new covenant relationship with Christ, not old covenant obedience to a law. It's not about rule keeping. It's about letting Christ rule in our hearts by faith. And I've mentioned this before. It's not about trying harder. It's about trusting in his finished work. And it is with this perspective that we want to now go forward into Colossians 3, so that we might see these verses as life-giving and liberating. Verse 14. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or perfection. If we remember from the last message, Paul gave the church at Colossae a description of their spiritual wardrobe, the clothing that they had on. He described this clothing that we wear in the inner man, which is Christ himself, we have put on Christ, his attributes, his character, his passions, and we have put off the clothing of the former man, along with his sins, 
his lusts, his failures, and all his guilt. And as born-again, regenerated believers, we have been given everything we need to live godly, upright lives in this world because we are, in fact, dead to sin and alive in Christ, according to Romans. But in all these things that we possess in Christ, there is something of utmost importance that Paul is asking us to put our minds on. There is something even greater that we are to focus on than simply what we have in Christ. He says, above all these things, put on or clothe yourself with charity. Now, other translations say love. Charity is, is the, the old King James version of that word love, but it is the central theme of the Bible. God is love, and the whole Bible is a portrayal of God's love for us as his chosen people through his son, Jesus Christ. In the Old Covenant, this was typified or foreshadowed by Israel. Israel was God's chosen nation, and he had a special relationship with them. And uh, in the Old Covenant, uh, he, uh, anyone who wanted to approach Christ had to do so through the mediator. Uh, there, it was not a covenant of faith primarily, it was a covenant of law-keeping. But in the New Covenant, all who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are the chosen ones. We are, as Romans puts it, the Israel of God. You could also refer to it as the New Jerusalem or the Bride of Christ. So the term for charity, as I mentioned, is love. And in the Greek, they had four different definitions for love in their culture. We only have really one. We phrase it differently. But in the Greek, they had four terms. They are philia, eros, storge, and agape. I'm sure we've all heard of agape. But philia, spelled P-H-I-L-I-A, that's where Philadelphia is stemmed from. This is a love that's found in strong relationships. For example, you would share a philia love with your best friend. Eros, spelled E-R-O-S, that's where they get the term erotic from. This is a romantic love, a love that should be between two people who are married, intimately involved. In English, we like to describe this love as not just loving someone, but being in love. That's how we differentiate between that special love. Storge, spelled S-T-O-R-G-E, is the type of love that we have in a family setting. So the love that a parent has for a child and vice versa. And then agape love, that's the big one, the one that we're reading of in our, in our passage here, is the greatest form of love. It's the love that God has for us as his children the love that Christ has for the church. It's best defined as unconditional love or selfless love. It's a love that loves even when not loved in return. And it's a love that doesn't depend on feelings to function. And for believers, as those who are filled with the love of Christ, this love is the presiding or the defining love with which we love others. Agape love is how true forgiveness is facilitated and true a, a unity in a relationship is perfected. It's kind of like miter bond. Those of you that install kitchens will know about miter bond or even gorilla glue. It's the perfect bond. Paul says that this agape love, this unconditional selfless love, is the bond of perfection. We all know about the familiar love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. At the very end of this chapter, Paul, or chapter 12, Paul segues from describing spiritual gifts in chapter 12 to describing agape love in chapter 13. In the very last verse in chapter 12, he writes, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then he goes on to describe uh, agape love in, in chapter 13. He's not moving on to a new idea here when he moves from spiritual gifts to love. He's simply saying there's something that must accompany our spiritual gifts when we exercise them. The ultimate way to express Christ is to put on the agape love of Christ, which is the bond of perfection, and then to go forward in ministering our spiritual gifts to others. So essentially he's saying, when you're exercising your gifts, do it from a place of selfless love, agape love. I'll just read a few of those verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. It gives us a little idea here of how important it is that we do all things with love. 1 Corinthians 13, some of you may even know this by memory. 
1 to 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. And then in verse 13 he says, And now abides faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Uh, before we moved to Kelowna, B.C. in 2008 to help there with uh, youth ministry, my dad took me aside and said, John, I just want to share a few things with you before you go. And he told me something there that I'll never forget. He said, John, people don't care how much you know until they, ca- until they know how much you care. People won't know how much, care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that went with me, knowing that whatever I share with people must come from a place of love for it to have any effect. So how do we become selfless? How do we attain to agape love, unconditional love towards others? Is it something that we simply try harder to do or to accomplish? Colossians 3, the first half, we, we talked about that last time I spoke, shows us essentially what we have in Christ, and among those things, we have love, because Jesus is that agape love in us. When we put on Christ, we put on love. And as believers, we have this love, it says, shed abroad or filled up in our hearts because Jesus indwells us. Jesus is love in us. And loving us with his perfect love, Jesus enables us to love as he loves. He is that power with which we can love others. And that power is supernatural. It is not of this earth. It is something that unregenerate people will not fully understand until they find Jesus and trust in him. Tapping into this power of love requires knowing it, believing it, and embracing it. Now, how do we do that? I think the only way to really delve deep into the knowledge of this love is by repeated exposure, constantly renewing your mind with the truth of God's love for us. Someone once said, uh, in order to know where you're going, you need to know where you've been. You might even say you need to know where you are. We've been to the cross, Scripture tells us. We've been to the grave with Jesus. We were raised up with Jesus, and we are now seated in heavenly places with Jesus. And I take these things as very real, very tangible. Even though my mind can't comprehend it, I am, I would say, washing my mind with this truth over and over again so that it becomes real. Because I believe that knowing something firmly leads to believing that. That will lead then to doing that and going forth with that. Knowledge, as I mentioned last time, is so crucial to the gospel. Hosea 4 verse 6 writes, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then in Colossians, if we go back to chapter 1, this message was preached by Dave way back, but chapter 1 tells us again the importance of knowledge. And I'll just read verses 9 and 10 here. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we see the emphasis Paul is putting here on knowledge as the key to believing and then doing. Knowing that the love of Jesus Jesus for me is unconditional. It doesn't depend on my behavior. And this is so key. His love for me doesn't change with how I've conducted myself throughout the day. He just loves me because I am his, his purchased one, his redeemed one. I received the adoption paper, so to speak, and I signed on the bottom line saying yes to the invitation to be his adopted son. And at that moment, I became his child, I became an heir, inheriting everything that he has, and he now loves me unconditionally and eternally. Believing this truth will open our hearts up so that we can love others with the same love that Christ has loved us with. Paul, I believe, is setting us up here, delving into the depth of the gospel of of Jesus' love for us so that we are prepared 
to receive the instructions that lie ahead because I think they tie so closely together to know the love of Christ is essential if we're going to act lovingly. And there's a passage that I read this week that was absolutely profound. I know I've read it many times, but it just hit me again, and it's in 1 John. And if you want to turn there, that'd be great, because I think it's very beneficial to see the words on the page. 1 John chapter 4. If we miss this aspect of the love of Christ in us, we will struggle to impart love to others. 1 John 4, 7 to 19. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. An incredible passage. So how does love cast out fear? Look at verse 16 once more. This is the answer to how Love casts out fear. He says, and we have known and believed the love that God has to us. When we know and believe that Jesus loves me, not because of who I am and how I behave, he just loves me, this will change our whole perspective in life. Only then can we start to love others as Christ loves us. It says in this passage that fear has to do with torment or punishment, you could say. But when we believe that God has forgiven me for all sins, that he has done away with all my sins, and that my behavior in him is no longer a catalyst to receive love, then we can rest. We can know that there is no fear before us in God. There is a reverence, of course, but there is no fear of torment or of punishment or of somehow being penalized for our behavior. And when this truth becomes real to us, that we know I am always in God's good books, I am never a recipient of his punishment, only discipline, and there's a big difference between the two, then fear subsides and we can rest and we can breathe. When we understand our security in Christ and the love of Jesus, and that he can only love us, fear is cast out, and we are thereby enabled to love others as he loves us. John said, as he is, so are we in this world. And we talked about that before with resurrection life. We are his righteousness. We are his love. And in verse 14 of our text, this is exactly what Paul is driving at. He says, put on love. Put on the unconditional the agape love that Christ has for you. Wear it, because that will bond you perfectly to Christ and in turn will bond you to the body of Christ. Love perfected is fear rejected. When love gets perfected, fear gets rejected and we all get connected. There's a little lyric we could put in a song. Eh? Perfect love casts out fear. Who's tracking? Are we, are we loving this message? Is this not life-giving? 
It's changed my life. I have to tell you, a little bit of a side note here. I had such a hard time forgiving for many, many years. Something had happened to me that was pretty devastating, and I just could not forgive this man for the way I was treated. And about a year and a half ago, I somehow received the knowledge that I needed. I understood it. I embraced it, that I am fully forgiven in Christ. Nothing I do will change that. Amazingly, what happened was I could instantly forgive this person. The bitterness was washed away because I knew that between me and God, there is no barrier. And for that reason, there was no barrier between me and this man. I think it's the secret to forgiveness, knowing the love of Christ. Moving on to verse 15, he says, Let the peace of God rule in your heart, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. We can take everything we just applied to the topic of love and apply it in the very same way to the peace of God. Jesus is our love, and Jesus is also our peace. Jesus made peace with God on our behalf. So this is not first and foremost an experiential or subjective peace that Paul is referring to here. This is the propitiation, the substitutionary sacrifice, the satisfying payment that Jesus wrought through his death on the cross. It's an objective peace, and it doesn't involve any doing from us. Jesus made peace with God because we could not. He is our peace. Ephesians 2 brings this out. Verses 13 and 14 reads, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, he's referring here to Gentiles, are made near by the blood of Christ. For he, Christ, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, in the context of this passage, Paul is saying that God brought the believing Jew and the believing Gentile together to be one, uniting them both to himself, in himself. But in the greater context, we have to understand that we once were aliens, enemies of God. We were, recon we were reconciled to God by the peacemaking work of Jesus on the cross. Romans 5, 1, ver uh, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So in making peace with God, on our behalf, Jesus reconciled every believer, not only to God, but also to one another. And that's a beautiful truth to consider. He made of the twain, it says, or the two, Jew and Gentile, one new man. We as a body of believers are referred to in the singular in Scripture. We are one body. We are not many bodies. We are one body in Christ. And it doesn't matter where you came from or how long you've been here. Your access is the same across the board to the Father. Someone might say, if this is true, why do we see so many divisions, so many sects and schisms and divisions out there in the, in the church world. There's denominations galore. The only answer I have to that is we don't always behave in the way that scripture identifies us. And I'm sure this is probably true of every one of us in this room today. We don't always conduct ourselves as God defines us in scripture. But as we heard last Sunday, let God be true and every man a liar. If scripture says this of us, then we can believe it and trust in it. Just because we don't experience perfect unity doesn't negate the fact that we are all united in Christ. A lot of people want to see it to believe it, right? You'll get that objection from unbelievers sometimes, but faith says believe it and then you'll see it. It's one of those things, your eyes won't be opened until that time. Paul says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the peace between you and God facilitate peace between you and man. And when the objective peace of God rules in our hearts, the subjective peace in our hearts and amongst each other can be experienced as a wonderful side effect. We may even get that peaceful, easy feeling that uh, the eagles sing about. I've come to realize more and more in my life that to be a productive Christian, to have a productive life in Christ, essentially boils down to believing God, trusting God, and then just letting God. I love that concept of just letting God, letting him take over. 
walking by faith, coming to the security of what he has done for me, what he's done to me, what he's doing in me, and then just letting that security settle me into a place of rest and freedom and liberty to serve without compulsion, without obligation. And Paul says at the end of verse 15, and be thankful. And when I think on the gospel of Jesus, all I really have left to say is, wow, and thank you, Jesus. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We heard in the Sunday school lesson uh, the importance of uh, the word of God as nourishment for our souls. And I believe that when Paul uses the term word of Christ, he is referring to the scriptures, but he's referring to more than that. It goes without saying that the word of God or the scriptures are an amazing way to be encouraged, to be nourished and fed, but it is not the only way. Think of the many believers out there who may never access scriptures the way we do, that haven't heard the scriptures and yet have come to faith. Is there a way for them to be encouraged? You know, the gospel has to work across the board in all countries and all nations. I believe there is, because as we heard in the Sunday school lesson, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. He doesn't make reading the Bible a condition for finding true peace and joy in the Lord. Now, having said that, read our Bible, absolutely, but it is not the only way. Jesus in us is a wonderful way to be encouraged by him. We have the spirit of truth who guides us. He speaks to us. We have fellowship with him 24-7, uninterrupted. And on top of all that, we have each other. And this is something I'm so grateful for, that we can have fellowship together, basically break bread together, have a meal together. And uh, in our modern world, we just have it so good in this culture. We have a plethora of ways to let the word of Christ dwell in our hearts richly. Technology has made this possible, that we can access the word of God through our phones. In one moment, you can look at any translation at any time. And for me, it's always been spiritually helpful when I'm having a low day, spiritually frustrated maybe, read or, or put on the, uh, the earbuds and just listen to a song or a sermon or something encouraging. Sometimes I'll send a little WhatsApp to a friend and we can have a little exchange and that's encouraging. And I think that's what Paul is driving at here. He says, admonish one another. And the word admonish essentially means to bring to mind, to remind one another, teach one another, not in a con uh, condemning or condescending way, but in a spirit of unity and love, we encourage one another to remember our purification, our unity, and our mutual love in Christ. I look at our church gatherings primarily as a way to celebrate Christ together, to remind each other how awesome Jesus is. Verse 17 says, And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Whatever we do, whether it be admonishment, encouragement, preaching, teaching, singing, praying, name any spiritual work or gift, Paul says, do it in the name of the Lord. What does it mean to do something in the name of Jesus? I believe it means that we do it as those representing Jesus, as ambassadors of Christ, as members of his body who bear his image and his name. An ambassador is someone who rep represents his home country while living in a foreign country. And essentially, you could say that we're all missionaries from heaven, come to serve on earth, right? As believers, this world is not our home, thank goodness. We are citizens of heaven, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, and we are strangers and aliens here. We have been translated, past tense, into the heavenly realm. But we remain here for however many years God would have us, as ambassadors, as advocates for his word, for the gospel, to share the love of Jesus and spread it around us. And when we speak or when we act, we do it with our heavenly citizenship in mind. This obviously includes our secular workplace, and I want to emphasize this. I don't even like to call it a secular job because to me, everything is spiritual in a believer's life. Your job is a spiritual job in a sense. We're always in the spirit. We never step out of that spiritual realm. As a framer, as a roofer, as a school teacher or a farm worker, your work is spiritual work. It's an act of worship that we do first and foremost unto the Lord. 
when we step out of this worship service this morning, we are essentially stepping into the outside worship service. And we never leave that identity as citizens of heaven behind. As children of the King, we're always representing Christ in everything we do or say, wherever we may be. All right, that was the fun part. Now we get into verse 18. <coughs> Wives, submit. Let's talk about this. I'm doing what John did in our Bible study for a joke. We're going to read the whole verse. Wives, and I'm going to try to expand just a little bit on the verse, but we're not going to go into depth on this. Here's what I'll say. Wives, submit yourselves out of your own volition, out of your own desire, to your own husbands, and that's a male married to a female, not someone else's husband, not another man's, to your own husbands, as it is fit, as it is, as it is appropriate, as it is proper, as it doesn't infringe upon your personal convictions, as it doesn't lead you into sin, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. It's a female of the opposite sex. Be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And then he repeats again, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Like I said, I'm not going to get into depth on marriage advice, but I'd like to address these verses all with the same brush, so to speak. In chapters 1 and 2 and half of chapter 3, Paul comprehensively describes our vertical relationship with Christ or the gospel. And I began this message by discussing the second side of that gospel coin, resurrection life or life in Christ. And I believe with all my heart that if we establish the vertical relationship, and I'm calling it vertical, it's not really vertical because he's in us, but so that we have a context for it. If we establish the vertical relationship or resurrection life with Jesus correctly, all of our horizontal relationships will function better. If resurrection life in Christ is our personal foundation, our horizontal relationships will work much better. They'll stand strong. If we, however, don't have a solid vertical relationship with Christ, all of our human relationships are going to struggle, possibly even crumble. And uh, the approach to dealing with human relationships in most secular counsel, in most humanistic psychiatry, is not effective. I'm not saying there's no place for it, but there's a better way. It's essentially providing remedies where we need a cure. And even in some Christian counseling, you'll find this approach. Uh, it's providing a micro-solution to a macro problem. Uh, I'll give you a common example from uh, a common struggle in marriage. A couple goes to a counselor. The husband starts in with his grievances. He says, my wife doesn't respect me like she used to. Uh, she's not uh, laughing at my jokes anymore. Uh, she used to greet me when I came home with a nice smile. Sometimes she'd even have a drink waiting for me on the table. And then in the evening, she'd sit and watch sports with me or even like a good action movie. And uh, she doesn't want to do any of that anymore. And she's not even Eros loving me anymore. Counselor says, okay, well, what about her? How does she feel? What does she want from you? Well, she wants to go for her walks. She wants to go shopping. She's typically asking me questions that are personal, wanting to talk about my feelings. Uh, she complains that I don't help her enough around the house. Uh, she expects me to watch Hallmark movies with her. And uh, essentially, she's asking me just to be another one of her girlfriends. That's how he feels. Okay, says the counselor, well, what if you were to help her around the house? Talk to her, open up to her about your feelings, and maybe even take her shopping now and then. And maybe watch the odd Hallmark movie with her. And perhaps she will start to watch games with you. She'll start to Eros love you again. Essentially, what he's saying is if you do this for her, then she will do that for you. It's a, what I call a tit-for-tat approach, or a you-rub-her-back, she-rubs-your-back approach. This is pretty common advice if you go to counseling. Now, I don't have a problem with this advice if we get the macro solution right. It's good to know our love languages and all that kind of stuff. But we want to talk about the macro solution. Remember what Paul said in verse 13. He says, above all these things, put on 
agape love, which is the bond of perfection. Marriage is a beautiful illustration of the gospel when husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. How does Christ love the church? Unconditionally. He did all the work and expects nothing in return, no payment required. He just asks to receive him. Agape love doesn't return love for love. Agape love just loves. And I'm sure many of you heard, have heard this little exchange. Uh, somebody says, well, marriage should be 50-50. We meet in the middle. And someone pipes up, I say, nay, nay, love should be 100-100. Both give 100%. But I have a third option. I think this is the biblical option. It's the macro solution to all of our problems relationally. A godly marriage is where two people both have their greatest needs fully met in Christ and are for that reason able to release their partner from any demands or expectations and love them with an un unconditional agape love. So it's having all of your greatest needs met in Christ that will enable us to love unconditionally as Christ loves the church. We were obviously created for one another as man and woman, as husband and wife. We were created to support each other, to complement each other, but we were never designed to meet each other's greatest needs. And I think this is where sometimes relationships go sideways because we're not meeting each other's needs, so we have to part ways. This is a position that only Jesus can fill. Now, what are our greatest needs as humans, as believers? I think oftentimes our greatest hurts, our greatest pains, reveal to us what our greatest needs are. We need to know that we are loved. I think everyone in this room would agree with that. We need to know that we are wanted. We need to know that we have significance, that we have purpose and worth. We need to know that there is peace, that there is hope for our souls, for our future, for, for eternity. And God has provided us with all of these needs in his son. When he died for us, he defeated sin and death. He made peace with God and he gave us that perfect peace that passes all understanding. And then he came to live inside of us, filling us up with his perfect love, his consolation, his comfort, his security. He gives us worth. He gives us value and purpose. He gives us a place of rest for our eternal souls. Union with Christ, a relationship with Jesus, when understood, when believed and embraced, is the answer for every need of our soul. Nobody can give us these things. No human being can fill those needs perfectly. Not a parent, not a child, no amount of money, no fame, no status, no accomplishments can fill the greatest void or the greatest need in our heart. That is a position that Jesus has for himself. True fulfillment of our greatest needs is found only in a personal relationship with Jesus. And I want to uh, emphasize that it's not just the doctrines of Jesus, it's not just the teachings of Jesus, it's the person of Jesus that we need. And when we do things God's way, we soon realize this is not only the right way, this is the very best way. Paul says, put on agape love. Let the peace of God rule in your heart and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When we allow Christ to fulfill our greatest needs, our ultimate needs, it will set the stage for successful earthly relationships. And we know this will take time, takes growth, there's no rush, nobody needs to be pressured into feeling I need to get there faster. There's a lot of unlearning that's involved. I think for most of us coming out of very religious backgrounds, we need to unlearn a lot of doctrines, a lot of falsehoods. We have to reset fleshly mindsets, uh, redevelop those neural pathways in our brain that were once so addicted to things. It takes time to learn these truths. So there's never any pressure on us to get there faster, but we know that this trajectory will bring us to peace in our earthly relationships. Spiritual growth only comes by time and truth. Learn the truth, and over time it will bear fruit. A godly marriage is fundamental to the health of our children, our church, and our nation. And I believe that, like as I mentioned, God created Eve for Adam to be a helper to him that was qualified and suitable for him. They were in many ways opposite, but they fit perfectly together. They were meant to complement one another. And husbands, when you love your wife with this agape love of Christ that is in you, the way God designed it, you are being the true self that God created you to be in the inner man. When we cherish her, when we lift her up, 
when we nourish her, we adore her, we carry her through her battles, back her up when she's being challenged, we nurture her. We are literally giving the world and our children the very best uh, picture of the gospel that we can give them. And wives, when you honor your husband as the head of the marriage, as the head of your home, you respect him, you build him up, you encourage him, you are giving the world and your children a beautiful picture of how the bride serves and honors Jesus Christ. In a world where marriages are by and large ravaged and torn apart by selfishness and sin, we as believers have such a glorious opportunity to show the world what true love looks like, what agape love looks like when we honor our husbands and when we cherish and love our wives as Christ loved the church. You know, in conclusion, the wonderful thing about regeneration, I find, is that what we often look at like as laws, as heavy burdens, or instructions for living, we have now been given as opportunities for worship. When we, when we see that Christ in us is love for other people, when we start to see our clothing, what we've been gifted with in salvation, we embrace that new identity. These passages that so many can become so restrictive and so burdensome or heavy turn into opportunities to express Christ to each other and to the world. Verses 23 and 24, and then we'll close. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Doing it heartily, in the Greek, this means from your inward parts, from your bowels, from the heart, from your inmost desires. Now, how can we do something from our heart if our heart is not regenerated, if our heart is not made new? It's a good thing we don't have a wicked heart. We have a new heart, a heart that is in line with Christ. When, you, when we know that we do life God's way, it will come with an abundance of blessings. And in the end, it says the reward of the inheritance. And again, an inheritance, as we mentioned, is something that you receive without any doing. You receive because you are a part of the family of God. And it's an equal split. There's no division like we do in families when we divide our inheritance. We give each child a portion, but in Christ, we all receive the full portion. It's the reward, singular, of the inheritance. Christians are the only people on this planet that can be themselves and express Christ at the same time. It's a wonderful thought, right? The speaker that I listen to quite often shares that. We're out of, out of time, essentially, so I think I'll leave verse 25 for next time. It has uh, quite a bit that I'd like to share with you on that, so we'll close. But in closing, I just want to read two verses. Ephesians 6, 22 and 23 in the NASB says, Peace be to the brethren, love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an incorruptible love. Now, think about this. The love that we have for Christ is incorruptible. It means it will not fade. We will not stop loving Jesus. For those of us who maybe fear, maybe one day I'll stop loving Jesus, Ephesians 6, the last verse says, we will not stop loving him. We have an incorruptible and undying love for Christ. My prayer is that our hearts were encouraged this morning by this message that these precious truths of the gospel and the joy and the purpose we find in Christ will give us motivation and encouragement for the week ahead. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for this opportunity to gather, to be encouraged by your word, the precious truths of the gospel, knowing that you love us apart from anything we do. You love us because we are simply yours. You have purchased us with your own blood. You have made us yours. We're in the family of God, and we have everything we need in you, Christ. I pray that this truth, that the love that you have for us, would just permeate our minds and our hearts so that we can, in turn, love those around us, even those who are difficult to love. Father, I thank you for changing our hearts and our minds as we look into these wonderful truths. Go with us now as you part. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Comments, questions? Last time I missed uh, somebody's hand, so if I don't see your hand, just speak up. Any questions? Comments? <laughs> We speak of it as the new covenant. I don't know if it's, uh, sorry, did we have a hand? 
John, go ahead. I'm blind, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, I'm just thinking about that you were talking about uh, our love comes from God, and if we understand that, then we'll be able to love better horizontally, so to speak. Right. One of the things I was thinking about is, like, God is the creator of all, mm -hmm. and yet we demand what only the creator could do to our spouse sometimes, and we're frustrated when it doesn't happen. Right. And so... But God is the one that can give that. No one, no one else can. And yet we look around on our horizontal relationships. We demand that on everybody to approve or what us or whatever. And then we fail to go to the source where the where the light actually comes from because He is light. Exactly. So yeah, just a good reminder that we need to look to the source rather than to the one that also needs the source. Yeah. Yeah, I think as, as we grow in our affection and love for Christ together, we also grow closer to each other, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful side effect of the gospel, so to speak. Any other questions? I'm trying to, oh, John, see, got you. Yeah, forced love is, is not a pretty love, right? Like, I think we've all heard of the Eastern religions where marriages have been put together by force. I can't imagine that in marriage, right? And I, know, I think God can't imagine that either, making us love him, forcing us to worship him. And I think that's why this doctrine of being free to choose Christ is so precious, that he wants a, a love without compulsion or obligation, that it comes from our heart. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, I just want to mention, like I mentioned New Covenant. I think one thing that we can maybe realize is that as Gentiles, we were never under the Old Covenant. So this New Covenant that we speak of is actually the only covenant that we've ever been under. And it began with God's promises to Abraham and that all who would come to the faith would be uh, children, in a sense, of Abraham <laughs> through his lineage, through his seed, which is Christ. And that's how this promise to Abraham was fulfilled when God promised him that he would be the father of a great nation, innumerable as the sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky, that was fulfilled by the spiritual Israel, by the spiritual people of faith who have come to Christ and are now fulfilling that promise in Abram. It's a beautiful picture too, right? All right, if that's all, then we will close and sing a song together. <laughs>